main things to do. Uh, one more new topic that will be on the test on Friday, integration in polar coordinates that I had to read about a little bit. I just posted up some completion problems to work on. I'm just going to mostly talk about the mechanics of it, how to actually do a calculation of a double integral in polar coordinates. A little intuition behind why it works, though it's certainly not a proof. Then we will talk about optimizing a function of three variables over a closed and bounded domain. And the, the compact closed and bounded domain I'm going to talk about is going to be a cylinder, and it's just like the take home problem, except it's a different function. So we'll talk about how to do that. And then that'll take a good chunk of time. Then we'll talk about what else to expect in the test, though we won't have a ton of time for that. I will add some things to the Mathematica notebook before I put it on the world some more examples to help you study for the test. All right, let's start though with the polar coordinate problem. It's down at the bottom of the notebook here. What I'm going to go ahead and pretend is we have a density function again. It's going to be a simpler density function than the one we've been considering so far. I'm going to call it rho because that's, that's a common letter used for density functions. Rho, that's not the, it's a free quarter rho. Of x, y, I'm thinking it'd be a simpler function here, x squared plus 3y plus 10. Let's consider the domain to be the same domain I considered in the plane that I called d2, and I'll go ahead and still call it d2 to emphasize it's the same disk domain that I've been considering recently. It's going to be a disk of radius 5 centered at the origin. Set of all points in the plane whose rectangular coordinates these are assumed to be rectangular coordinates. Satisfy this inequality. Because I'm assuming these to be rectangular coordinates, that means that I am visualizing this in the usual way as a disk of radius 5 centered at the board. Whenever you draw a domain, you are implicitly assuming that some coordinate system drawing. Typically it is rectangular coordinates. Though I will also describe this domain in polar coordinates and the description, symbolically speaking, is different. But the way you draw a picture is the exact same. A disk of radius 5 centered of the origin. Okay, so you can imagine this to be the thin plate of metal if you like. And we're trying to find mass because we've got units like grams per square centimeter. The mass intuitively can be thought of as found by adding up the little masses, if you like, dm. So here's sort of a, a conceptual equation. It's not rigorous. We're intuitively imagining breaking up this thin plate of metal into little tiny pieces, little tiny chunks, little tiny squares infinitesimally small, though we don't draw them infinitesimally small. It's an imagination tool of mass dm, and we imagine the integral as adding up those little dms to give us the total mass. Specify the domain as a subscript of the double integral. How do you calculate dm? Take the density in grams per square centimeter times the area of this little chunk here in square centimeters. Rho is the density, dA is the area. Grams per square centimeter, square centimeters. Again, this is just an imagination tool. This is not rigorous math. Imagine this to be a product. It would give you a mass in grams. It would give you a dm. In grams. It's not the acceleration due to gravity, this is in grams. Add those up to get the total mass. That's the conceptual idea. It also can be thought of as a volume. We talked about on Monday that you can think of this as a volume. How would you think of it as a volume? You graph this density function in three dimensions. Imagine a z-axis coming out of the board. You graph it sideways, okay? 
it would be the volume of the solid created by projecting that graph down onto this domain here. That solid that you create, I could also call that integral a volume. The volume is the max. The volume of the solid geometrically is the same numerical value as the mass of the thing that played the metal. It's all in how you're thinking about it. As far as calculating it, we talked about how to do that. If I want to think of this either as vertically simple or horizontally simple, it's going to help me think of it as an iterated integral. Again, I'll use parentheses even though you don't have to. to emphasize the concept that there's an inner integral and an outer integral. Iteration means doing something over and over again, in this case twice. Let's go ahead and put the function as rho of xy here again. dA can be imagined to be dx times dy. Imagine this is being an infinitesimally small rectangle of width dx and height dy. Maybe it's a square, maybe dx and dy are the same. Don't take that too far. Okay, this is all intuitive. If I think of it as a vertically simple region, is it the dx that's on the outside or the dy? If I'm thinking of this as being a region between two graphs of two functions of x, yeah, dx is the outer one in that case, because the inner one, dy has to go, y has to go between these two functions of x. The lower limit is going to be negative square root of 25 minus x squared, and the upper limit is going to be positive square root of 25 minus x squared. For each value of x between negative 5 and 5, x goes between negative 5 and 5, that inner integral from in terms of y goes from here to here, which depend on x. Different x would give you different limits of integration for y. Function of x there. Three-dimensionally, you got the graph up here. What are we doing? We're really slicing that graph slice is perpendicular to the x-axis. Graphs up here, I slice it this way. For any fixed x, one of these inner integrals gives me an area under the graph up here. Under, meaning with your head sideways. Okay. Under the graph. That gives me a cross-sectional area function, a of x. a of x gets integrated from negative 5 to 5 to give you the total volume. Solid, which again is the mass of this thing. Once again, doing this integral would be challenging. The inner integral is not hard, it's the outer integral that's hard. You do the inner integral, the antiderivative is certainly easy. But because the limits of integration are complicated, you end up with a function that would be difficult to integrate by hand. So I'm integrating out the y to get a function of x. That function of x, which you know you could factor out the square root of 25 minus x squared out of that to write it as a product. Um, and again, I'll emphasize to do the integral of that, well, I guess it may be good to leave it in pieces in this case. Integrate these things, each individually, it would involve a trig substitution, x equals 5 cos theta, 5 sine theta is the typical one to use. Um, and typically these integrals involve, end up involving secants and tangents. And we saw earlier in the semester that that can be kind of complicated. Of course, you can look it up in a table or you can use technology. But just realize doing that by hand is not real pleasant. You then want to integrate that function from negative 5 to 5. I'll just copy and paste it in here. So I'm not writing this as a double integral, but this is effectively doing the double integral. There's the answer. Does this make sense? You should think about whether it makes sense consistently. Try to make a habit of that. The value of the integral is about 1276 grams, if you're thinking about it as a mass, I'll make a contour plot, a row, 
over the given domain. Let's see, let's uh, add lots of contours in here. Let's do the region function thing to restrict the domain. What's the area of the entire disk? The area of the entire disk is pi r squared, 25 pi in this case. 25 pi is about 78.5. What's the average density? Somewhere in the ballpark of 13, 14, 15. If you took 78.5 times 13, for example, what do you, well, 14 maybe, what do you get? 1,099, evidently that's not big enough. My intuition about the average density must be off. It must be closer to 16 or 17, perhaps. Close to 16, 16 something evidently is the average density. I guess because I shouldn't focus on like halfway through here. There are sort of overall the graph, as far as the shading goes, is lighter. Because you've got light here, light here, light here, and dark only down here. I should have been, been expecting because of that that the average value is probably not going to be halfway between the top and the bottom here. It's probably going to be a little higher. So initially I was thinking maybe an average value around 11 or 12. I guess I had a little intuition that it was a little higher than the x-axis there. The average value is between 16 and 17. The average density. By the way, if you did the integral the other way around, if you treated this as a horizontally simple region, which we could do, then you'd have dy on the outside, dx on the inside. You would just change the x's there to a y's, and this would still be negative 5 to 5. The inner, you know, this row function is not symmetric with respect to x and y, so we should expect the a of y function to be different than the a of x function was. It is different. More complicated. If you were doing this by hand, it would be, if you had to do it by hand, you'd want to do it this way, because this function's less complicated than this one two terms versus three terms. So if we integrate this with respect to y, where y goes between negative 5 and 5, amazingly we should get the same answer. So how do you do this in polar coordinates? Okay, again, I'm just going to basically just tell you what to do. I'll give you a little bit of intuition why it works. The book is a little bit more rigorous than me, still not fully rigorous. They do talk about things in terms of Riemann sums, which is technically more rigorous in limits of Riemann sums. We're still integrating over d2, so we can still write the integral initially in the same way. If you convert to polar coordinates, before I write what I'm going to do here, let's describe d2 in polar coordinates first. As a set, technically speaking, if you're purely thinking as a set of ordered pairs, it's a different set. However, the way you visualize it is the exact same way. It's still a disk of radius 5 centered at the order. But as a set of ordered pairs, it's all ordered pairs labeled with r and theta, where r goes between 0 and 5, and theta goes between 0 and 2 pi. As a set of ordered pairs, that's a different set. But we're visualizing it the same way. It's 
still visualized as the disk of radius 5 centered at the origin because we're visualizing it with respect to a polar coordinate system. And because of that, that's, that's the key thing that makes it nicer here, is that these, these end up being the limits of integration, and they're all constants, no functions. That's the key thing that makes it simpler to do. Typically, you put the theta on the outer integral, so I'll put a 0 to 2 pi there. You don't have to, but that is a typical thing people do. R goes from 0 to 5, that'll be the inner integral. I won't bother using parentheses here. You've got to get the integrand in terms of r and theta as well. And the most obvious thing to try here is to replace the x with uh, r cos theta and replace the y with r sine theta. And then, I guess, drd theta? Anybody want to stop me? r drd theta, not drd theta. Leave some space here. dA does not equal drd theta. It equals RDRD theta, which is kind of fun to say. DA equals RDRD theta. This is the DA here. And that's the key extra thing that's kind of unexpected and must be there to get the right answer. You will get the wrong answer if you don't put that extra factor of R there. Why is the extra factor of R there? Next week, next Monday, we're going to talk about transformation. Again, I, said, uh, I think I said on Monday that you can think of the polar coordinate convergent equation as a transformation, a mapping, is another word used. And we'll talk a little bit about how to think about things in terms of transformations, and that will help us see where the R comes from. It'll be a little bit more rigorous than what I'm about to do. What I'm about to do is just draw a little picture and think intuitively in terms of infinitesimals here. Okay? And this is where it gets kind of shaky with infinitesimals. It's kind of fun for a bit until you realize that in many situations you're not quite sure what to do. And this is maybe one such situation. If you imagine this as being an infinitesimally small angle, Again, whenever we think about these things, we never draw them infinitesimally small because that's impossible to do. And in fact, in the standard real number system, infinitesimal numbers don't exist. We're only pretending they exist. So they call non-standard analysis what they do, but that's pretty difficult. Call this distance right here R, and well, I'm going to make a dr in here as well, but it's going to look fairly big. You think I want to make dr small, but. I'm going to make it look like that and make this distance here be ER. The area of this wedge thing here, that's your DA. Why is DA not equal to DR or D theta? Because the further you are from the origin, the bigger, quote unquote, the infinitesimal area will be. If you're closer to the origin for the same r and d theta, it's for the same dr and d theta, it's a smaller area. Again, which doesn't make any sense if it's infinitesimal to begin with. So that's a little bit of intuition. If you want to be a little bit more specific, if you think of these as actual positive quantities, the length, the arc length of that arc there is the product r times d theta. The radius of the circle times the angle in radians. So that's a little bit of intuition about why that's an RDRD theta. But it's got to be there if you want to get the right answer. What's the function going to be? Rho of r cos theta, r sine theta. Go back up here. Replace the x with r cos theta. Replace the y with r sine theta. You'll get r squared cos squared theta plus 3 sine theta plus 10. Integral from 0 to 5, 
r squared cos squared theta plus 3 r sine theta plus 10. Don't forget the extra factor r must be there to get the right answer. Multiply the r through the parentheses, distribute it through. This becomes r cubed cos squared theta plus 3r squared sine theta plus 10r. You're integrating that with respect to r, which is pretty easy to do. One fourth r to the fourth cos squared theta plus r cubed sine theta plus 5r squared. r goes from 0 to 5. That's nice. Plug in 0, it's, everything's going to go away. So you've just got to plug in 5. Plug in 5, plug in 5, let's see. The constant terms are going to come from these two, oh, excuse me, sorry about that, just this one. 5 to the 4th, uh, 625 over 4. O squared theta. Here we have 5 to the 3rd, 125 sine theta plus 5r squared is another 5 cubed plus another 125. To integrate cos squared theta by hand, I always use a certain trig identity. I use the fact that cos squared theta is 1 half plus 1 half cos 2 theta. That's one I always remember for integrating cos squared theta. If it were sine squared theta, the identity is that that equals 1 half minus 1 half cos 2 theta. And it's a cosine when, when it's sine squared theta. Which makes sense since cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. If this is cos squared theta, sine squared theta would have to be 1 half minus 1 half cos 2 theta because if you add them, you've got to get 1. So the cos 2 theta is going Cancel on the one half plus one half and then one. Mm -hmm. For the exam, um, if we don't have these memorized, could you suggest we have these trig identities? I, I suggest you put those on the on your note card, yeah. So yeah, the sine squared theta is one half minus one half cos two theta. That's the one to use for sine squared theta. Uh, anyway, um, the constant term that you're gonna get from this do this in my head here. 625 over 4 times a half is going to be 625 over 8 plus 125. Let's see, 125 is 1 over 8. Is it 1,000 over 8? Twenty-five over 8 is going to be the constant term that you integrate. From 0 to 2 pi, think about that, you'll get 625 over 8 times theta from 0 to 2 pi. In the end, that gives you 625 over 8 times 2 pi, or 625 over 4 times pi. 625 pi over 4 will be from the constant term. And actually, that's going to be the answer because, yeah, right? That was the answer, 625 pi over 4. Because the other ones are going to integrate to 0. This, these two things are going to integrate to 0. Um, when you integrate the cosine of 2 theta with the 625 over 8 in front of it, you'll get um, 620, uh, 625 over 16 because of the 2 there, sine 2 theta, but you evaluate that from 0 to 2 pi, sine 0 and sine 2 pi, sine 4 pi are all 0. 
this equals zero, often you write an error to zero. It doesn't mean it's going to zero. It is zero. It's not a limit. And the other one, this one integrates to zero as well. Let's see. Integrate one. It is 125 sine theta. So that would be minus 125 cos theta from 0 to pi. However, even though cos is 0 and cos 2 pi are not 0, they're both the same. They're both 1. So you get cancellation. This equals 0 as well. The answer is that, which again is the same thing we got with Mathematica. 16, 25 pi. One more double check. 0 to 2 pi here. 0 to 5. Um, the original function here, r squared cos, let's write it as cos theta quantity squared plus 3r times sine theta plus 10 times r. Don't forget that extra r. That is a common mistake, even though I'm emphasizing it. I know from the past, even though I'm emphasizing it, people still forget it. Okay? That's the main thing to emphasize here is this extra r. One will be. Don't forget it to get the right answer. By the way, Mathematica, of course, doesn't know that you are imagining R and theta in polar coordinates. So, so the Mathematica, these are just a bunch of symbols like x's and y's. I could, of course, replace the R and theta with an x and y, x, dx, dy, with those limits of integration, I get the same exact answer. But for your sake, conceptually speaking, since you are thinking about polar coordinates, it is best to use the other letters. And because of that, it is, it is kind of amazing that this works. I think it's kind of cool. One of the cool things in this class, that this does give the same answer. And notice, for one final point of emphasis, that this integral is definitely doable by hand in a reasonable amount of time. Whereas integrating these things is not really doable in a reasonable amount of time by hand. If I had to do that by hand, uh, it might be a one question test. You know, it might take me 50 to 60 minutes. Even me, yes. I don't want to do it by hand. I don't want to. All right, let's go on to the optimization. Got to go pretty quickly here so we have a little bit of time for review more generally. So this is going to be related to your take home exam. Uh, we're in the case of this type of function here. This is the section, function from R3 to R. Same function as before, except I added the z squared term there. I've got the partial derivatives here. Set those derivatives equal to zero to find the critical points. And just like before, there were four critical points. And in fact, since I only added a z squared to the function, the critical points are effectively the same as the two-dimensional example, except with the z coordinate of zero. Those x and y coordinates are the same as before with the two-dimensional example. These points are lying in the xy plane inside three-dimensional space. They are the four critical points of the function. You can use the second derivative test with the Hessian matrix and its eigenvalues to find, to describe, or, or classify these critical points. Again, you're just trusting me here. I have told you what eigenvalues mean. If you want to know what eigenvalues mean, you'll learn in linear algebra and differential equations, actually. You learn how to calculate eigenvalues by hand, and you learn what they mean. Of course, you 
person. Well, I can probably be on the test. It's on the take home, yeah, you gotta use this code. You're trusting me that when you do this, you get these numbers that it reflects what's going on near the critical points. When you have a mixture of positives and negatives, here, here, and here with the first, second, and fourth critical points, that means those are saddle points. When you've got all positives like you do here for this critical point, that means that point is a local minimum. Somehow, in some higher dimensional sense, must mean some higher dimensional graph is like concave up in three different directions somehow. Actually, to make it a little less esoteric, think about it this way. The fact that this point is a local minimum means that if we move away from this point a little bit in any direction, in three dimensional space, the output of the function will grow a little bit. Here are the outputs at these different points. The third one again is the local minimum, 236.573. So if I, if I change the inputs for this third one a little bit, just a little bit, I should expect a slightly bigger output. If I change them a lot, it could be smaller because these are only local classifications. So if I take that third input and change it to say 1.75, comma negative 0.86, comma 0.1, I should expect an output a little bit bigger than 236.573. Yes, 236.584, a little bit bigger. Any other point you pick sufficiently close to that local minimum point will give you an output a little bit bigger. With the saddle points, it's trickier. The fact that these other three points are saddle points intuitively means if you move away from these three points, Sometimes it gets bigger, sometimes it gets smaller. It depends on the direction that you're moving. The contour map in three dimensions can help us figure that out, actually. And actually, let's look at the animation here. And I went ahead and made this animation for output values that go up higher than before. Before, I only went to 240. Now I'm going to go to 280. So as I let C increase here, we're looking at level surfaces for higher outputs of the function. This is telling you the function is increasing here initially as you move to the right as x increases. But look at, then we get a generation of this ellipsoid kind of shape near this local minimum, which should make sense. My output values are getting higher. This level surface here consists of output values that are a little higher than they are at the, at the local minimum. But if you keep going, that continues to expand until all of a sudden you swallow up that critical point there. What is that telling you about why this is a saddle point? It's telling you that if you travel along a line between these two points, approximately at least, if you move away from that critical point along that line, the function values will get smaller because this was a little menu. If you travel towards it, you're going to get smaller. If you travel along a, a plane effectively, essentially perpendicular, or close to perpendicular to that line, right about like this, away from that point, the function values are going to get higher. This level surface corresponds to output values that are a little higher than they are at that saddle point. Keep going. Keep increasing C. Looks like we're going to envelop the other critical points. So this is kind of interesting. We actually envelop, okay, there we go, we're enveloping that one. So again, near this point you go in this direction, either way, your function values are going to go down. You go along some plane about like this, away from the point your function values are going to go up. What about the last one? The last one behaves differently. I think that's the one with the two negative value values. It sort of engulfs it in a different Way. Actually, it engulfs it this way first. Yeah, it's inside there. And it goes back this way. It's sort of it's going in the reverse direction, kind of. But the other one's in. Unengulfing it there. So that's telling me with this critical point, if I move along the line about like this away from it, function values go up. If I move along some plane about like this, away from the function values go down. 
What if you move in some direction in between? It's harder to tell whether the function values go up or down. Let's restrict the domain now to the cylinder. This is like your take-home problem. In fact, this is the exact same cylinder as in the take-home problem. It's a different function of the exact same cylinder. Through the use of graphics 3D and cylinder, I can actually get the cylinder in the picture. There it is. Isn't that pretty? So now we're looking at the level surfaces for this function only within the cylinder. x squared plus y squared is less than equal to 25. z goes between negative 5 and 5. And this cylinder, it's, it's a solid cylinder. It's not only the, the cylinder itself that's the outside boundary, it's also everything inside. It is a compact set. It is bounded for sure. The cylinder's not going up and down forever. Z is cut off at 5 and negative 5. It doesn't go off to infinity in any, in any direction. You can put it inside a sphere of a sufficiently large radius center at the origin. It is a bounded set. It is also closed intuitively, that means the stuff along the boundary is part of the set. I'm considering that to be the set. We can apply the extreme value theorem to this compact, closed and bounded set. Those are equivalent terms. Compact means closed and bounded in Rn, Euclidean space. Um, because of that extreme value theorem, that means that the global maxes and mins will be achieved. There will be some points where the function is highest and lowest overall along this uh, filled-in solid cylinder. And those global max and min values either occur at critical points in the interior, the four critical points that are inside there, here, 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 and here. They're all in the xy plane. That's a little hard to see there. or along the boundary. If you think about the level surfaces, probably the global maxes and mins are going to occur along the boundary. Function values are low over here and high over there. Remember, we saw in the animation the level surfaces moving this way as C increased. Probably the global mins over here somewhere, and the global max is over here somewhere, maybe at the, not the bottom, maybe somewhere up here and down there. Actually, by symmetry, the behavior of this function in the z direction is symmetric with respect to z equals 0. The behavior at z equals 5 and z equals negative 5, the top and bottom circles, are exactly the same. How can you analyze that behavior? You can reduce this to thinking about functions of two variables. I can create a new function, call it g, though don't get this confused with the Lagrange multiplier g. What am I doing here? I'm plugging 5 in for z into the formula for f to get a function of just x and y. Think about what that's doing. That's going to give you the same outputs. g will give you the same outputs as f does along that upper circle, that disk, I should say. Here's the formula for g. Just depends on x and y. Here's a contour map, two-dimensional contour map. Looks pretty similar to the original two-dimensional f, doesn't it? And this is supposed to be a reflection of essentially taking this picture and looking straight down like this. Actually, again, because of the symmetry in z, if I replaced z with negative 5, I'd get the exact same function. Watch, this function doesn't change. It's the same formula, same contour map. So if I analyze it for z equals 5, I analyze it for z equals negative 5 as well. The behavior along the top circle, the top disk, is going to be the same as the behavior on the bottom. You can try to find global max and mins of g along these disks. Again, you've got the local max, local min, saddle points here and here. Looks like a global max will occur over here, and a global min over here. You can use Lagrange multipliers to find those, or polar coordinates to find those, use r equals 5 and let theta vary from 0 to pi. I did both of those things as well. 
you've effectively found the global maximum gain of the original function along the top and bottom disks. But we still have the side boundary to think about. What about this wrapped around side boundary? You can unwrap it. What do I mean by that? I mean create another new function, call it h. That's a function of the cylindrical coordinates theta and z. Take the r coordinate to be 5 because we're on the boundary of the cylinder. 5 there. Plug in 5 cos theta for x, 5 sine theta for y, z for z, into the function f. Effectively, when you do that, you, well, you get a function of theta and z that's going to involve cosines and sines. It'd be kind of complicated looking. But if you make a contour map of that function, theta going between 0 and 2 pi is the angular coordinate, z going between negative 5 and 5, you've effectively Taking this cylinder, got a pair of scissors out, cut the cylinder along the vertical line at theta equals 0 or 2 pi, and unwrapped it. You get this contour map. This contour map is actually periodic if I continue it in theta to the right, like if I go from 0 to 4 pi. It's a periodic contour map. I don't need to do it from 0 to 4 pi, because that's just theta going around and around again. All I have to do is think of it from 0 to 2 pi. Notice it seems like, at least along the side boundary, we've got some sort of global minimum right about there. Evidently, z is 0, z is up and down here. Z is zero, what's theta? Theta probably is a little bit bigger than pi, it looks like. Pi is right about there. Yeah, theta is a bit bigger than pi. We could differentiate this function, find its critical points. This critical point is going to have an angular theta value. I'm not thinking of theta as an angle in this picture, but it's going to have a theta value of something slightly bigger than pi, and z equal to zero. That's going to correspond to the minimum of the original function along the cylinder back over here. And theta is a little bit bigger than pi, where this min is going to occur. And in fact, I bet that's the global min. It looks like it's probably the global min of the function over the entire solid cylinder. And you can find its x, y, and z coordinates. Z is zero for sure. X and y can be found by taking whatever theta value you get here and doing 5 cos theta comma 5 sine theta to get the x and y coordinates of that. Where does the global max occur? Probably, think about it intuitively here, right there and down here. Those are different points. One's on the top disk, one's on the bottom disk at the intersection disk with the side, the circles. And that makes sense again because the function is symmetric in z, which is the z squared term. Probably those points give you the global max values of the function of the entire cell itself. To confirm it with the calculations, what it looks like by looking at these contour maps, that that's what global max means right here. Global min over here, global max. Probably right about here, and the symmetric point at z equals negative. All right. So this is pretty amazing. We've used a lot of tools here to try to get this, and this is what your uh, your take-home exam is like. And now we only have three minutes. Oh, let's see. This happened in the other class too. I think it's fine. Um, so I've got the, a list of other topics here for exam three. Essentially, it's all of chapter 14, as well as the first two, well, three and a half sections of chapter 15, skipping section 15.3. Uh, 
class, the first half of session for the full recording. I think in the few minutes we have remaining, let me just emphasize a few things about gradient vectors. And then before I put this on Moodle, I will add in some examples. But I've got to write your test first. I will spend the afternoon writing your test. And then tonight, hopefully I can get some more examples in here and put that up on the table. Let's just spend a two minutes thinking about gradient vectors. So if you've got a function of two variables, the gradient vector looks like this. You should be familiar with the different ways of thinking about this. You can certainly plug in particular points to get particular vectors. You should also realize that you can think of this as a vector field, which is really a function. You plug in points into this function, you get vectors out. You visualize those vectors by basing them at the point that is being plugged in. Whatever this point is, say it's um, 4 over 1, draw the corresponding vector, maybe it looks like this, maybe it's the vector uh, 5, 4. That vector gets drawn at that point. That's the point that you plug into the gradient. So the gradient of that at the point 4, 1. And you do that theoretically for every point in the plane. You get a bunch of vectors. You can't draw them all, of course. You draw some sampling of them. Mathematica also scales them down in length to make the picture look nicer. What do you want to know about gradient vectors? Well, one of the most important things to know is that they are always orthogonal to the level curves. And when the level curves get further apart, for example, the gradient vectors actually get shorter. Further apart for a constant contour interval. Remember most of the output intervals. between successive outputs of the function along the level curves. You should also think about this in terms of the chain rule for paths and the directional derivative formula, these two formulas. Um, the derivative of a function like this is the gradient of f plug in c of t dotted with the velocity vector. Imagine C of T as being the path of a bug through a temperature field. And this would give you the rate of change of the bug's temperature as it moved. And you should also realize this mean is the same as the length of the gradient vector times, uh, not dot, times the speed. Right? This is the velocity vector here. Its length is the speed times the cosine of the angle between them. For example, if that angle at a certain moment in time is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, this is going to be maximized if the bug is traveling in the direction of the gradient vector at that particular moment in time. The directional derivative will be, well, the, this quantity, this derivative will be maximized. The directional derivative formula is a similar kind of thing. You need u to be a unit vector. That dot product, you can think of that in terms of lengths as well, since u, u is a unit vector. Think of it this way, the length of u would be 1. And that helps you realize the gradient vector. If uh, u is in the same direction as the gradient vector, this angle will be, is, will be 0. This will be maximized. The directional derivative is maximized in the direction of the gradient vector. All these are pretty important things that do come up on past uh, in-class exams. And that's what I chose to emphasize here in the last couple of minutes of class. But again, I'll add some more examples here before I put this on. Study hard. Yeah. Super hard.